Good evening, everybody. My name is George Condes. Um, it's uh, a great honour to be with you, with you this evening to celebrate this vlog's 30th anniversary um, as a society. Um, I'm going to be speaking this evening about the development of ultrasound as a tool to diagnose endometriosis, and I'll be taking an historic view uh, and take you on a journey from soft market development back in the early 2000s until we are until where we are today. Uh, when assessing deep infiltrating endometriosis. So if we wind the clock back to 2001, which was when the original soft markers for endometriosis were developed, they included uh, ovarian immobility and site-specific tenderness whilst performing a transvaginal ultrasound scan. And it's important to remember that these were developed by Tom Bourne um, specifically because at the time I was working with Tom and I was looking after the PULs, pregnancies of unknown location, and my colleague Emma Karakaru was assigned to look after soft market development. And it was very clear that there were many women that we were taking to theatre who had a normal ultrasound scan. And in 2001, the only predictor for endometriosis at that point in time was the presence or absence of an endometrioma. And so in those women who had a normal pelvis, we would often find the presence of endometriosis at laparoscopy. So this was an attempt to try to reduce um, the number of women that had undiagnosed pathology at the time of laparoscopy, or more to the point, to increase our ability to predict abnormality using ultrasound scan. And so from a conventional assessment perspective, using trans transvaginal ultrasounds, we were performing a basic pelvic ultrasound scan in accordance with the AIUM. And uh, when it came to assessing the potential features for endometriosis, we could only assess for the presence or absence of hard markers. And these include endometriomas or hydrosalpinics. So, uh, and what did this mean at that point in time for these women? This meant that there was no detailed surgical planning. It was a unidisciplinary approach from a gynae perspective. Um, if a woman did have significant uh, bowel endometriosis, then there'd be an unplanned intraoperative colorectal consultation. Without bowel prep, the patient would herself would not be appropriately consented. There'd be no specific uh, consent relating to either urological or bowel procedures. And as a result, these women would then undergo suboptimal cytoreduction. And we know that the best results for these women occurs when we perform the, uh, the optimal surgery at the first surgery. Consequently, these women also had a higher rate of complication and they were subject to two-step laparoscopy for higher stage disease. So a very unsatisfactory situation in 2001. <clears throat> if we wind forward 19 years to 2020 in a well-oiled, um, functioning advanced gynae ultrasound unit that um, works in complement with a, an advanced endoscopic unit or is the one and the same, um, utilizing the IDEA approach, um, which was developed by the IDEA group in 2016, we can now see that a, an advanced endometriosis expert guided ultrasound scan not only looks at uterus and ovaries, but now has the ability to encompass soft marker evaluation, sliding sign evaluation, plus compartmental evaluation of the pelvis looking for any signs of deep endometriosis anteriorly or posteriorly. What does this mean for the patient in the modern era? Well, this means that we have detailed surgical planning. We can uh, invoke a multidisciplinary team, which is in accordance with the World Endometriosis Society and the NICE guidelines. We can arrange rather than an intraoperative unplanned colorectal consultation, we can then make sure our patients get a preoperative consultation with colorectal. They have full bowel prep and the consent rather than being very broad and non-specific is, is very specific in 2020. So this will potentially include bladder resection, ureteric reimplantation, and depending on the presence or absence of bowel disease, they would also be scheduled for rectal shaving, rectal vasectomy, or segmental resection. This will result in optimal cytoreduction in the form of endometriosis at the first surgery. And because we're planning these surgeries with the right people at the surgical table at the right time, we're going to have a lower complication rate. This also results in a one-step laparoscopy for those women with higher stage disease because we're using ultrasound rather than laparoscopy to diagnose the endometriosis. We're therefore, we're able to bring the best skilled, most appropriately skilled surgical team together for the procedure, which is individually based on the scan results for that particular woman. 
Now the question is how did how did we make this transformation in endometriosis ultrasound? How did this occur? I think there's several factors that have resulted in this transformation when it comes to the imaging of the pelvis with, for women with potential endometriosis. And this certainly includes the evolution of luminary ultrasound units over the last 20 years. The development and implementation of new ultrasound techniques and innovations. I think a greater understanding of anatomical locations of deep endometriosis, particularly when we think about the compartmentalization of the pelvis. Greater collaboration between luminary ultrasound and luminary laparoscopic units. An interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approach for women scheduled for um, surgery who have symptomatic endometriosis. Um, and I think one of the most important things that's occurred in the last 20 years has been bringing together these luminaries and experts as part of the International Deep Endometriosis Analysis Group, for which we then um, were uh, commissioned to develop the consensus statement, which was published in 2016 by the White Journal, the arm of ISWOG. I think also there's been a greater synergy between imaging and surgical technologies in the last 19 years. And uh, with that, I think, is the emergence of a uh, a, 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 almost a new super specialist, the surgeon sonologist. And we've seen this in the gynae oncology world where there are individuals who uh, do a gynae ultrasound fellowship and also a gynae oncology subspecialty fellowship. And I think we're seeing this now in the endometriosis world where like myself, people are undergoing both a gynae ultrasound fellowship and following that up with an advanced uh, laparoscopic fellowship. So they're able to to, to marry those, 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 those amazing skills um, under the one service, under the one hat. When it comes to the luminary ultrasound units around the world, um, I thought I'd go through those uh, individually. And so when we look at the uh, combination between Guerrero and Alcazar, both as a team and as individuals, they've contributed Italy and Spain tremendously to the literature over the last 19 years. And uh, they're best known for their work in, in uh, de determining endometriomas, uh, working on the implementation of three-dimensional ultrasound for the diagnosis of deep endometriosis. And they've also worked in, collaborative, in collaboration to develop the concept of transvaginal tenderness guided ultrasound to predict the location of deep endometriosis. Um, and this has been a really important aspect uh, for improving diagnosis for women with deep endometriosis as well. They've also, using 3D ultrasound volumes, developed ways to teach uh, non-experts um, the how to how to how to recognise deep endometriosis, and they've also published learning curve studies in relation to this as well as several meta-analyses. Also in Italy, the Exocustos group, so Caterina Exocustos, I think, have also been working diligently in this field over the last. Uh, 15 to 20 years, um, coming up with specific staging systems for endometriosis, um, also uh, mapping out the extent and location of disease, particularly in those women that are scheduled for uh, surgery. Um, and uh, she's also with her team looked at, uh, with gold standard outcomes, the performance of 3D ultrasound, particularly looking at the junctional zone to predict adenomyosis. We move now to South America and Abrao and Gonzalez have worked together as a surgical and a radiological team. And I think, um, I, I think have been leading the field in this area for many years. Um, and there's been many Australians that have visited this unit in Sao Paulo to be taught uh, deep endometriosis imaging. And uh, the work that they've done has been very important in, in setting the tone for the way in which we should preoperatively plan surgery for these women and then do so in a multidisciplinary fashion. They're great advocates of the use of bowel preparation. Um, I personally don't think and don't use bowel prep myself. Uh, and I think that it's probably an important thing to be utilized early in one's career as an endometriosis imaging specialist. But I think as you become more expert and more experienced, I think the need to do this is probably uh, using bowel prep is less, less important. Ferrero's group also in Italy um, have uh, become very expert and published significantly in the area of rectal, rectal water contrast transvaginal ultrasound to predict uh, uh, rectal sigmoid endometriosis. And there's been two publications that's come out of Simone's group looking specifically on randomized trial, looking at the 
uh, implementation of bowel prep versus no bowel prep, and they found that there was no difference in one's ability to predict rectosigmoid endometriosis using transvaginal scan. They did the same study also uh, in using bowel prep and non-bowel prep in patients uh, undergoing rectal water contrast transvaginal sonography. So again, bowel prep, I think, is a, a personal preference as a sonologist, but not a necessity. Bazot's group in France as a radiologist have been very active in the fields of uh, comparative diagnostic accuracy, accuracy studies, looking at the performance of transvaginal ultrasound to transrectal endoscopic sonography, comparing uh, uh, transrectal ultrasound also to MRI, um, and also looking at the differences between uh, uh, the transvaginal ultrasound, rectal ultrasound, uh, rectal endoscopic uh, sonography, and also MRI to predict uh, deep endometriosis. Chaperon is a uh, champion in this field, and he and his team, again, have, I think have been uh, setting the path which we've been all trying to follow diligently over the last 15 to 20 years. And he certainly has been one that, that grasped onto the concept very early in the piece that ultrasound, particularly transvaginal ultrasound, should indeed be the first line imaging modality when preoperatively mapping the extent and location of disease for women with deep endometriosis. Jurkovic's group, Davos group, has also been very active in this field and have published significantly in the uh, feasibility uh, of visualizing the ureter as well as um, commenting on the predictability uh, of uh, uh, ultras transvaginal ultrasound to visualize ureteric, periureteric disease. And this has been very important as part of also the development of the idea consensus statement. In Austria, Gernot Hudler's group uh, have published several learning curve studies and also done significant work in uh, determining that ultrasound is a very good tool at delineating the distance from the anal verge to the most inferior aspect of the rectosigmoid lesion. And also they themselves um, have been uh, developing a Enzian ultrasound-based system, which is soon to be published in ACTA. So great work done by Hartlist. My unit, <clears throat> with the assistance over the last 10 years uh, by two of my PhD, Shannon Reed and Matthew Leonardi, so a big hello and thank you goes out to those two. Uh, we've been very active, uh, particularly in the area of uh, the sliding sign development to predict out to Douglas obliteration, the use of uh, standoff techniques, techniques such as uh, gel sonovaginography, um, as well as um, the development and uh, multi-center internal and external validation of the UVES system. And more recently, we've been looking specifically at the prevalence of the sliding sign, uh, negative sliding sign in low-risk population, and also developed a new ultrasound technique called sonovidography to predict superficial endometriosis. So I think my team also has been working very carefully in this field to, to, to help improve the performance of sonologists around the world to understand not only how to do ultrasound for endometriosis, but also to, to have a clear understanding of the different anatomical locations, which hopefully in turn will improve everyone's performance when it comes to predicting deep endometriosis. So if we think about the uh, early innovations, particularly uh, soft market development, and this was Bourne's team, uh, with first author, uh, Mekara Karo. And so, again, remember that the aim of that first study was to use ultrasound-based soft markers to predict pelvic pathology so that we, in turn, could um, have a clearer understanding preoperatively of those women who are more likely to have pathology when planning uh, laparoscopic surgery. <clears throat> and this study predated the... Uh, the wave of work that's being done in the field of deep endometriosis imaging. The original soft markers were ovarian immobility and site-specific tenderness. And so ovarian immobility is an indirect marker for adhesions, uh, tethering the ovary to neighboring structures or multiple structures and the most common structures being the uterus and the pelvic sidewall. However, the ovaries also can be adherent to the bowel and intramedially to the uterosacral ligaments. So uh, we know that from Marasinger's work, a combination of ovarian immobility and clinical findings was able to demonstrate sensitivity, a high sensitivity and specificity of 92 and 61% for the detection of endometriosis at laparoscopy. Ovarian immobility we also know is strongly associated with the presence of an endometrioma and also pouch of Douglas obliteration. Um, 
Uh, however, we may not necessarily require soft markers to diagnose endometriomas, uh, and the addition of this soft marker may improve our ability to stage endometriosis severity preoperatively, allowing for improved surgical planning. Uh, Shannon Reed, I've, I've been pleased to see that through her work at Liverpool Hospital, <clears throat> that they at the most recent Congress, which was the virtual Congress, had a couple of talks on the negative ovarian sliding sign, which may be a potential predictor for urethralysis of surgery. And we know that this is a really important aspect moving forward because um, in those patients that have a uh, normal pouch of Douglas with no obvious signs of deep endometriosis, uh, if there's the presence of pelvic sidewall disease, often these women do need urethralysis. So up until now, there's been not a good ultrasound marker to predict the need for this in women who've got a relatively normal pelvis. So watch this space. More recently in 2019, Shannon Reed uh, and myself with Matthew Leonardi published on unilateral ovarian fixation being um, identified in 68 of 189 of our cases, and for women with isolated superficial endometriosis, left ovarian immobility was significantly associated with left uterosacral superficial endometriosis. So three quarters of women with left uterosacral deep endometriosis had left ovarian fixation, compared to 28% without left uterosacral deep endometriosis. So since the original publication by Akaro et al, there's been um, several studies that have also uh, established soft marker evaluation as a reasonable approach. When it comes to the second aspect of soft marker evaluation from the site-specific tenderness, I think that the data is probably less um, convincing, and certainly there are limitations in relation to uh, potential standardization of pressure applied, the reproducibility of the test, conflicting alternative of diagnosis, and, and also potential for high false positive rates. More recent soft markers um, have included Pouch of Douglas sliding sign, which was developed by my team in 2013, <clears throat> and Pouch of Douglas obliteration can occur with, with endometriosis. We know that particularly in those that have got deep endometriosis, the rectum rectosigmoid. And so when assessing dynamically the, the, the pelvis, we want to see whether or not it's possible for the anterior rectum to glide freely over that retrocervical region. And we can assess for either complete or partial obliteration or non-obliteration of the pelvis itself. And in the original publication by Shannon Reed et al. in, I think it was 20, 2013, we have 100 cases consecutively, and of the 30 women that had pouch of Douglas obliteration, 19 had evidence of bowel endometriosis. In the same edition of the White Journal, Huddler's group also published on the uterine sliding sign as a soft marker to predict rectal endometriosis. So uh, really, I think uh, a really good idea that's also been incorporated into the idea uh, um, consensus and I think has been embraced internationally as, as, a, as a way to predict uh, potential severe higher stage disease and also the need for a, a multidisciplinary approach for um, difficult surgery. So here's an example of a woman who has a positive sliding sign. And so we would predict that she would have a non-obliterated pouch of Douglas. <clears throat> and this is an example of a woman who's got a negative sliding sign, we would predict that this woman has got an obliterated pouch of Douglas. <clears throat> so new techniques that uh, come to place, so there are standoff techniques that dating back to 2003, and this was Desolet's group. And so they use saline infusion uh, sonovaginography. So they installed saline into the vagina, and this creates a standoff between the tip of the probe and the surrounding structures. And this improved the performance of sonovaginography compared to transvaginal ultrasound alone to detect rectovaginal endometriosis with sensitivities improving from 44 to 90% and the specificity improving from 50 to 86%. More recently, my team and also Leon's team have published on a more modified technique which uh, doesn't require um, a second set of hands, and this is gel infusion sonovaginography, which is also an outpatient based technique to uh, visualize again the posterior vaginal fornix, rectovaginal septum, surrounding structures to uh, denote very clearly the presence or absence of posterior compartment endometriosis. A variation of this by Cossi's group uh, in Brazil. Uh, used 3D gel infusion sonovaginography, and they felt in their study <clears throat> on the left of screen, we can see that this is a mid-sagittal view with a normal rectovaginal septum. <clears throat> and on the right of screen, we can see that this is a mid-sagittal view and a coronal view, 
where we've got the presence of the cervix. This is the um, posterior vaginal fornix, the rectal vaginal septum. And here we can see here that there is a rectal vaginal septal deep endometrial, deep endometriotic lesion. Ferrero's group has done a lot of work on the uh, technique of rectal water contrast transvaginal um, ultrasound scan. <clears throat> and this is where the probe is placed inside the vagina and tepid water is infused into the rectum. And again, this creates a standoff technique and so enables us to visualize very clearly the presence of rectal or rectosigmoid endometriosis. Bazot's group have championed the concept of transrectal endoscopic sonography showing invasion of the muscularis, although it's not a great predictor for invasion of the mucosa or submucosa, similar also to transvaginal ultrasound. So which of these techniques when we consider these, it's best to predict deep endometriosis. Well, my team has recently published a systematic review and meta-analysis answering this exact question, looking specifically to see what's the optimal imaging modality for the detection of rectosigmoid deep endometriosis. And so this is um, an article that's soon to be published in the White Journal, and we can see that when we go to the conclusions, the sensitivity of transvaginal ultrasound for detecting deep endometriosis seems slightly better than MRI, Although, interestingly, transrectal endoscopic sonography was superior to both. The specificity of transvaginal scan and MRS were excellent, but we concluded that as transvaginal ultrasound is simpler, faster, more readily available, we believe it should be the first line diagnostic tool of choice when evaluating the pelvis in a woman who's potentially got deep endometriosis. I wanted to quickly touch, touch on our newest technique, and uh, you could consider even uh, progressing this talk to from soft markers to deep endometriosis visualization through to superficial endometriosis visualization. So we've developed a new technique and this was our feasibility study in 2019 where anatomically we instill, you can see beautiful views here in mid-sagittally and a transverse view where we've installed artificially saline into the pouch of Douglas using a uh, intrauterine balloon catheter. And so this is normal anatomy and in the study which we followed up with where we can see these are images from our study, we can see that these hyperechoic lesions that are present in the pouch of Douglas with fluid that extends that region represent uh, superficial endometriosis. And those filmy adhesions, which we can see in this bottom left view here, uh, and also in the middle of the uh, middle of the lower row, also represent um, filmy adhesions in the presence of superficial endometriosis. So in the study that we published just recently in the European Journal of OBGYN and Reproductive Biology, we can see that the performance of sonopedography to predict superficial endometriosis, particularly in those women without deep endometriosis, without ovarian endometriomas, and with a normal pouch of Douglas pickup rate was 77.7%, which is currently better than the uh, complete inability for ultrasound to visualize uh, superficial endometriosis. So very exciting study, very exciting technique read the paper, get stuck into it. Um, so, as I said, I think the most important uh, development in the last 20 years really was bringing together luminaries and experts. But why did we need to do this? Well, at the time of the inception and the idea group's publication, there was significant heterogeneity between ultrasound studies, but same structures and anatomical locations. So this meant that it was very difficult to compare the results of these different studies uh, from, 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 one, uh, from one nation or one country to another. So we aim to standardize the terms and conditions which, we, which would be adopted internationally and hopefully result in consistent use of nomenclature when using the ultrasound location and extent of endometriosis. In turn, allowing us to hopefully have meaningful comparisons between studies in women with an ultrasound diagnosis of endometriosis and facilitate multi-center research. And indeed, this has done so because we've completed the pilot study for the idea group and now we've moved on to phase one and we aim to recruit prospectively data from 1500 women ultrasonic data ultrasound data and laparoscopic data with histological gold standard outcome in units that are expert in both ultrasound and laparoscopic surgery so for any of you out there today who are very keen to be involved with the idea group then uh, drop me a line uh, via either my twitter account or via my email address georgeconvers at gmail.com so I think that this, this publication in 2016, um, I think represented the, the, the culmination of a lot of work, um, firstly by Stefano Guerrero in 2011, when um, he uh, discussed this concept at the Copenhagen meeting. 
And then he and I came together again in 2013 and began the process of actually developing the consensus statement. And I think at this point also, it's very important to acknowledge the great work that's been done by the Lervin Group um, from the point of view of Thierry van den Bosch and also Dirk Timmerman um, and uh, Ben van Kolster because of their work in, in the setup for, and Willem also in the work for the setup for their clinical data miner um, and also the uh, tightening up of the ethics and now the actual rolling out of the of phase one of the IDEA studies. So thank you so much to the Lurban group. <clears throat> so why is preoperative, uh, the preoperative IDEA ultrasound important? Well, <clears throat> I think if you look at the, the potential journey of a woman with endometriosis, seeing potential general practitioners, fertility specialists, general gynecologists, advanced endoscopic surgeons, <clears throat> then each of these individuals along the course of that woman's pathway has an opportunity to to change the course of their pathway in a way that could reduce that delay from first presentation to diagnosis. From a general practitioner's perspective, knowing what the state of the pelvis is is really important because then you can justify other non-surgical intervention or refer that patient on to either a generalist or an advanced endoscopic surgeon, depending on the extent of the disease. From a fertility specialist perspective, it's really important when planning um, egg retrieval and deciding whether someone may or may not have significant endometriosis, so doing a preoperative uh, expert guided idea consensus ultrasound is really important from the specialist perspective. From the generalist perspective, I think it's important if they're planning surgery that, that they must do a deep endometriosis ultrasound beforehand so that they themselves don't get caught out in a situation where they are well beyond their skills um, and needing then to send the patient on for a second laparoscopy. From an advanced endoscopic surgical perspective, again, it's really important to know ahead of time if there's any urological disease or bowel disease, because obviously it's a great way then to plan the right people being there, getting that multidisciplinary team involved, getting the patients to preoperatively <coughs> see the colorectal team and also urological team, and also even potentially involve the pain specialist group as well. So surgical list planning is really key, and this is underpinned, I think, by the expert guided idea ultrasound from a deep endometriosis perspective. So <clears throat> moving forward, I think the audience today is converted. It's the ISWOG audience. And I think we need to try to <clears throat> extend and, and convert as many non-believers as possible. So that means that each of us, I think, has a responsibility to our patients and also to our colleagues to be talking as much as possible about endometriosis imaging. So if you are a sonologist or an expert in endo imaging, I would encourage you to, um, to educate GPs locally. I would encourage you to, to work closely with your endoscopic or advanced laparoscopic or minimally invasive surgical colleagues so that they can also understand the benefits of, of such technology. Because it's important to remember that most gynecologists are only still receiving reports for basic pelvic scans which only can tell the person who's reading that result whether there's an endometrioma present or not. We know from an international survey that we did that's been published in the White Journal that awareness of deep endometriosis imaging is poor. <clears throat> and unfortunately, even amongst those that are aware, cynicism does exist. And, uh, and in some places, it's not possible to, to do a deep endometriosis ultrasound because there's just not the resources there. So. I'm setting to you, I'm talking to you today about the, the best optimal approach, but there are still so many more things that we need to be doing in this area to improve what we've done. I think that the journey from soft markers through to deep endometriosis imaging has been an amazing 20 years. Um, and I think that the next 20 years, I think are going to be just as exciting with the development of newer techniques to predict superficial endometriosis. Um, also to look at the different aspects of the idea groups, prospective international multi-center studies. And I think there will be significant changes, um, not just at the clinician's level, but also at the patient level. And ultimately it's gonna be all about you know, improving patient outcomes. And I think that the, the key to that is high quality ultrasound scan. So I thank you for your time today. And I really hope you enjoy the rest of your time during this uh, anniversary for ISWOG in the 30th year. Thank you and good night.